Hey everyone, it's Tony Tom Logan back with another video for you. And today we're going to be taking the today we're taking a look at a lot of stuff. And to be fair, if today is the day that you're looking at it, go and have a look at the channel because there's loads of other videos and reviews gone up. But this one is about the MSI Unify. It's quite high up in the range, not quite godlike, but almost there. It's definitely aiming for a halo, but a halo without RGB. It's also got an awful lot of power phases on it. 105 amps each and they're 19 of the blighter so you get 18 for the cpu so lots and lots of power but no rgb black stealthy can it perform as well as it looks though <laughs> Okay, so we are going to be talking about the Unify and I am going to give you a really good look around the board in just a sec, but I do need to draw attention to something that MSI did. And they sent me this massive loot crate box toolbox thing, which is actually on a hinge because it's this big. Basically, it was like a big presentation pack that they sent out to the reviewers and influencers, whichever one I might be reviewer I would have said and it also come with some Kingston Fury although I'm not meant to say Kingston anymore although it has got Kingston still on it anyway Fury memory DDR5 memory and they also sent me the cooler and it's a core liquid S360 cooler which they wanted me to use but the problem is I use the same kit for every one of the motherboards it goes in the same case which is actually a fractal defined no it's actually just the 7XL then I use the same cooler, which is a Corsair H150. And then I swap the fans out on the uh, Corsair cooler for some 3000 after PM Noctuas. And I test all the boards in the same way with the same fan profiles, the same coolers. When we do stock, we just enable XMP. We don't change anything else. And I do that to keep things absolutely fair across all of the boards, because if this cooler performed worse than one of the other ones, then MSI would actually be behind and we wouldn't be able to compare the motherboards fairly. But I will be using this with something else later on, including the memory. So you will get to see it. It's just I want to keep things very fair, scientific as I possibly can do with my little basic brain for the actual motherboard reviews themselves. So keep your eyeballs and you see this appearing later. rgb -less. it's very monochrome, I want to say, but there's no real white, so we can't really say. But I do want to bring up the block diagram because we're on to just motherboard reviews now. So this actually makes my life a bit easier. Now, this gives you an idea where the PCI Express lanes are being utilised. You can actually see the PCI Express 3, for example, lane, which popping it back onto the screen is this one here. Then you can also see above, obviously the PCI Express E lane goes into the PCH, which is the chipset. You can see the M.2s through there, M.2, 2, 3, 4 and 5, all goes into the PCH. Although I was a little bit annoyed, doesn't tell me the bandwidth available with those. But it, then you've got the LAN, the Wi-Fi, the SATA, the USBs, there's a lot all going into that PCH, but at the top you can see the PCI Express uh, at the top with 16 lanes. If you use two graphics cards, for whatever reason, you can see that it's shared, it then goes eight times, eight times. Do need to remember that it's PCI Express 5 as well, not PCI Express 4, so there's just ample there. Um, it's just a shame that SLI and Crossfire have pretty much been phased out. Uh, and then you can see that the very, very top M.2 goes straight into the CPU and it doesn't go via uh, the chipset. So the fastest M.2 is going to be that very top one, which is this one. There is another one here and then there are two at the bottom. One of the things I do want to say is I have done a full breakdown preview separate video of this if you would like to go and take a little bit more time and digest more of what this board's got to offer because in this video effectively what i'm going to do is give you a brief quick look around and it will stand up on this i'm going to give you a brief quick look around so that we can have a quick look uh, and keep the video shorter but if you want a more in-depth look then you can go and have a look 
live or, or on the other video. I have spoken about stuff far too much today. So two eight pins in the top right hand corner. When we come across that large heat sink, which is hiding 19, 105 amp power phases. It's absolutely insane underneath there. It's a very, very sexy uh, looking power phase and power area. And all of this heat sink is metal. There's no plastic hiding on the top of this. It's a proper job. And the reason why there's no plastic on it is because there's no RGB or lighting needed. Now, you can see that you've got some uh, CPU fans, but you can also, just at the top up here, see a thermal header that you can plug in. But then you've got CPU fan, pump fan, and system fan. Pump fan will run at 100% if you want to use that for a fast, uh, obviously a pump, but a fast actual fan itself. And then you get two more fans on the outside, as you can see, and then just below that, you can see the J rainbow. Now, that is a three pin addressable RGB header come down a little bit more j corsair that is a corsair header that you can plug straight in which will link into all of your iq stuff uh, if you've got corsair uh, hardware you'll know about the clips that they use so you have the fan header and then you have the other header that will actually click into the board and you can control the board through that or you can the board can control uh, outside corsair stuff if you want as well you have here some voltage readout points. These small LEDs here give you an idea on what stage the post process is at, should you want to, and then you have another thermal sensor. Obviously the 24 pin. 24 pin, nothing particularly to talk about, you'd think, but if you look carefully, all the pins look the same, and they're all square as well, and that's because they're all solid pins in there. There's none of the folded round cheap ones that you get with some of the other boards. Uh, one of the Asus's, for example, only has solid pins on these two pins here. MSI have put solid pins on all of them, so that is actually a big upgrade. Underneath you can see USB 3.2 Gen 2. Going down, that is two USB 3s and then six SATA ports. I'll flick it round, hoping that the motherboard doesn't fall off, but you can see them there. And it, it does give you a lot of I.O. The fact that they're um, horizontal rather than vertical is going to help keep things nice and uh, tidy as well. Now, down the bottom of the board, we'll scroll along. You get a power and a reset switch. Then you can see you've got the BIOS switch there. Two internal USBs, which is going to be very handy because obviously they're USB 2s, by the way. So things like your power supply, your RGB headers, uh, AIO coolers use them as well. We always need more, and I think two is an absolute minimum. Coming across, you can see you've got a water flow header. Now, this is a pump speed kind of thing, so you can get an idea on how quick your pump is flowing or how much water is being pumped through a water cooling loop. Then you have three more fan headers, and then you have a four pin RGB here and a three pin RGB there. Now, oh, that was good timing. So we have three fan headers on the bottom and then five at the top. So that's actually quite a lot. Then obviously, like I said, you get two M.2s here and another one here and another one here. So you have four in total that go into the chipset. This one underneath here is another M.2, but that fires straight into the CPU. So that's gonna keep things nice and easy for you. Five in total, four into the chipset, three into the CPU, the fastest one you want at the top, and also the fastest one has a bigger heatsink because you can see it is raised. Then you've got the massive power area around the CPU socket itself. And then when we spin around the back, there is an awful lot of connectivity, which is nice to be seen. But one of the things that overclockers will like is that PS2 port, if you're still using those. Um, it can be very handy when things aren't posting and taking time and uh, activating USBs and stuff. Anyway, BIOS flashback is available, CMOS clear switch. You can see that you've got USB-C there and two 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports. Don't forget, you do need a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet router or switch if you're going to start networking these up. I have seen news go live on the OC3D website that Mark's done recently saying that there is now a 2.5 gig unmanaged switch available, which isn't stupendous money. 
So this could be very handy. So just make sure that you've got that and you're gonna need more than a Cat5 or a Cat5e cable. You're gonna to need to go at least Cat6 to be able to cope with this sort of stuff. Don't also forget that it's not gonna make your internet faster unless you've got some amazing internet and crap networking at the moment. Then your Wi-Fi uh, and your gold-plated audio outputs. Okay, so we've had a good look around the board and now the first thing I want to show you, which you're going to think is quite strange, is the power usage for the board. Now you can see that it kind of sits in the middle. Now the overclock at the bottom that you can see for the Hero is actually the board that I used to overclock the processors in the first place. At launch, because of literally silly reduced time and stuff, I've just done stock results and some of the boards I am going to go back and do extra overclock stuff on. So that's the reason why there's an Asus overclock at the bottom. It was just because that's the board I used for the original processor review. But it does give us an idea on what's going on. Now, something I will say is because we're running them at stock and they can kind of move around and draw power where they want and they do boost a little bit uh, dependent on the uh, setup for the BIOS, the f then the reason I'm drawing attention to this is you can see that this sits in the middle. And... In reality, what you want to see is, yes, you want to see them not necessarily using lots and lots of power, but it's going to explain where this sits in the graphs now, because it does, uh, through a lot of the results, dominate the middle of the graphs. And that has been consistent with it. It has been, though, very reliable, very cool, very calm, and very collected. But at stock, if you fit and forget, then it isn't going to set the world on fire. I do think, because of the way it's been built though, an overclock is definitely something that I will be looking into when I get more time, because the, the processes were very late and uh, things got delayed in customs, so we've literally had a uh, f seven day kind of working period, and we were all, uh, everyone I think worked all over the weekend to get the processors done. Now I will say that I've obviously tested both processors. It takes me over a day to do a single set of tests on a processor and there are two processors. Then I've also, which is live on the channel, gone in and done a DDR4 versus a DDR5 setup um, and compared the results as well. So that had to all be tested twice again because I tested the i9 and the i5 and those are all on the channel. So yes, I've not done a big overclock on a very expensive board, but I will go back and do it. I just wanted to make sure I had something live for you on the day. I will say though, that I believe the limiting factor of overclocks is going to be that uh, the CPUs themselves rather than motherboards, because a lot of the boards are very well specced. So when you're looking at something like the Unify, I would suggest that you're first and foremost going to be looking at the aesthetics. And uh, the aesthetics are going to be something that's going to sway. Then you're going to be looking at prices. This one definitely isn't in the cheaper end of the market. And this one, with a quick edit, because I did need to double check, comes in at 509.99. So if you end up buying one of these and then you end up grabbing hold of an i9, you're going to be spending around £1,100 for a board and a processor, which is an abs a lot of money. Uh, but like I said, the, the limit won't be the board. But the other thing that you need to look at with this board, and it's something to kind of keep in mind, is you've got a lot of fan headers. There's a lot of cooling going on with the VRMs and the power regs and everything on this are incredibly high spec and massively overrated as well. The other thing to keep in mind is the fact that you have five NVMe slots. I know a lot of us are kind of moving away from uh, like SATA stuff. And I say a lot of us, not everyone. Yes, I know there are a lot of you out there still with SATA drives, but this does give you access to be able to run an awful lot of NVMEs. The other thing you do need to consider though, is you're not gonna, if you populate everything, the bottom four, you're not gonna get completely untethered throughput on all of them, but I very much doubt you're gonna be using all the drives at the same time unless you're running RAID anyway. Uh, this one, you definitely want to have your main OS on, but this would also be the one later to keep in mind that if it comes to buying a DDR, PCI Express 5 NVMe, that's going to be this one. So, lots of NVMe, big burly board, lots of spec, uh, all of the power trains and the layers and everything, it's obviously built 
to a high standard and it comes with a relatively high price tag although I will say most definitely not the highest price tag because I have seen boards at seven and eight hundred pounds I think a lot of you with this are just going to like the fact it's uh, black the stock results are good I would suggest that there's probably a few things where you can give it the processor a little bit more power or turn off the Intel specification so that it will boost a little bit higher and it will perform better. I would also suggest uh, that you're probably going to want to have a play with XTU or giving it some manual overclock to tweak the P and E cores and I think you'll do very well with it. It's definitely a very capable board and I don't think it's going to let you down. So for Tiny Tom Logan, trying to get as many of these things done for launch, <laughs> this is another video for you. Out. Ding! Love you, sis.